Your name is? David M. Thomas. And what's your middle initial stand for, David? McEwen. McEwen. Is that a family name? It's an old family name. Yes. So David um, was born what year and what city, David? I was born in Clay, Kentucky. What and, uh, your birth date? May the 30th. What year? 1925. Okay, May, 20, May, May 30th, 1925 in Clay, Kentucky. What, and then where'd you go to grade school? And then why did your parents come to Evansville area? I went to grade school in Sacramento, Kentucky. And my parents came to Indiana because my dad found a job in Petersburg, Indiana. What was his job there in Petersburg? Working for my uncle, who was a, a contractor, he, he sold siding, roofing, and so on. And then, uh, did your parents ever move it to Evansville or not? Did they ever come to Evansville? No, my parents never did come to Evansville. What brought you to Evansville? Well, <clears throat> I came down in the first part of 1943 and hired in at Fultz Castor Corporation. That was my first major job. Tell us what you did at Fallis Caster. It was very important in World War II of making casters and all kinds of products for World War II. What was your part at Fallis Caster? I was a shipping clerk and uh, I, I filled orders. Was it pretty busy? Uh, God. Was it Fallis Caster pretty busy shipping orders? And what did they order? Ship things everywhere in the world or just the Evans zone? No, they shipped everywhere. Uh, they made from tiny little casters to big casters as actually railroad used. Even casters you see in the kitchen drawers, they made casters for kitchen yeah. drawers after the war and even during the war. During the war, yeah. Made things roll a lot easier. Yeah. Um, Maybe a thousand employees during the war, not quite that many. Oh, at Faultless, I doubt if there was a thousand, uh -huh. but there was at least 500. Yes. Now, you were there in 43, so you were just 18 years of age at that time. Right. Uh, World War II broke out when you were 16, when you were a youngster. Um, and we're going to talk about your experiences in World War II and in New Jersey and the uh, Army Air Corps, but what did you think about when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and what did your parents tell you about the war? My parents didn't have to tell me uh, about it. I was old enough that I realized what it was and uh, how, how serious it was. Uh, I realized that very, very well. What did your other students, you were just a sophomore in high school when the war broke out, or even a freshman, what did the other students think about that? And what did you, what did you were you fearful of, of Japan and of Germany during that time? Oh yeah, the, uh, the thinking of everyone during then was uh, we hated the Japanese first of all, and we didn't like the Germans, but we disliked the Japanese more than the Germans. Now, you worked at Faultless Caster there in 1943. You came down here from Petersburg, I guess, to get that job. Mm -hmm. But you were only 16 and you were working there at Faultless Caster at a young age. But a lot of people were doing that because the war effort were taking yeah. other people away. Now, uh, in 43, then at some time, you got in the Army. Can you tell us about, did you enlist in the Army? How old were you got in the Army? And then where did you go to basic training, if you remember? No, I didn't enlist. I was drafted. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your draft number or how low your draft number was? Or everybody was drafted, I guess, if they were yeah, eligible. Yeah, everybody was drafted. I, no, I have no idea what my draft number was. But uh, I was just in, among the thousands that were being drafted. And then where did they take you to get do a physical exam and get you uh, a, and take you to uh, basic training? Do you remember where you went? I got my physical training, uh, physical, right here in Evansville. Uh -huh. Was that downtown by the post office? At the old armory. Old armory. Yeah. 
And was the line very long when you got your physical exam? Or? Oh, there, was, there were several there, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, and then after you got your physical, you must have passed it or you wouldn't have gotten in the, in the Army. Then where did you go from there? Well, my first stop was up at Indianapolis. What was it? Camp Port, Fort Harrison was big up there. Fort, ben Fort Benjamin Harrison was my first place that I went after I was inducted. They taught you how to sh how to march and taught you how to wear your uniform and behave. Well, they didn't teach us so much there. Uh, they just that was mostly issuing clothes to us and so forth. Did you get two uniforms or one or how many did you get? Well, I got uh, I got a summer dress and I got a winter dress of uh, wool, and then you got fatigues that you wore when you trained. How many pair of shoes did you have? A Two. boots, a boots, and black boots. Two. Uh huh. So close to three uniforms, two pair of shoes, but it would fit in your duffel bag, everything. Right. Yeah. Then after you're at Fort Van Harrison in Indianapolis, where did you go from there? Uh, well, I went to, to, to Mississippi, but I can't think of the name of the... Well, Mississippi the, has a bunch of bases. I don't remember. Down on the coast is Biloxi, but that's more Navy. Um, but you went to a base there and probably did some training. Yeah. Then after you left Mississippi, you ended up in New Jersey? Yeah, because I, I put down from the very outset that I wanted the Air Corps. <laughs> Why'd you want the Air Corps? Because I just loved airplanes. Uh-huh. And so you did. You got Army Air Corps. We. Didn't have an Air Force in World War II. We got the United States Air Force started about 1947. So anybody, they called them Army Air Corps That's in right. your time. Which dated back to World War One. To World War One, and they had started Air Corps. Eddie Rickenbacker was our biggest pilot in World War One. Famous the most uh, hits of all World War One pilots. Uh, but pilots and planes became so important in World War One that we also understood the importance of World War Two. What was your, uh, do you remember the Evans Airport? Do you ever remember any planes flying around there when you were working at Faultless Caster? Oh yeah, but of course, the P-47s were just in the process of being built when I mm -hmm. first worked at, at Faultless. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, later on, when I would come home on furlough, I would pass what is now the Whirlpool, or it was Whirlpool plant. And that big parking lot out there in front was full of P-47s tied wing to wing. Many as you could see. Yeah. You couldn't hardly believe it, could you? Come back on for a little, you yeah, saw that? And especially after I went to a P-47 base, and then I'd come home and see a parking lot full of P-47s. So I, I was proud of that. Yeah. Proud of that. Tell us a little bit about that base uh, in Millville. Millville, New Jersey was famous during World War II. They trained over 1,500 pilots on P-47s in World War II, and they gave them advanced training. So before they would go over to Europe, they uh, did advanced training for these pilots. These pilots were already trained, but David is, uh, we're in Evansville, Indiana right now, and the, today's date is uh, uh, 1 uh, 31, 2007, 16. Uh, David's now 91 years of age. Well, I'll be 91 in May. 91 in May. Uh, yeah. But he was at a place where they had probably over 50 P 47s flying around all the time. There was probably 50 there. T tell us a little bit about your experiences. You were based there about two years, 43 to 45 or 46. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how loud the machines were, the P-47s, and what you did on the P-47s, what you, how you helped out. Well, I was a range instructor uh, on a skeet range, which that sounds odd, but we gave the uh, young officers 
uh, a chance to shoot skeet, and that taught him deflection shooting. You know, how to lead targets. I mean, whether you're flying an airplane or shooting quail, you feel you still use deflection shooting. You have to lead the targets. And uh, these young second lieutenants mostly, you know, this that Millville was just a stopping off place for them before they they shipped overseas. And uh, they were they were young guys and they'd come out on the range. They'd, if we didn't watch them they'd shoot at birds rabbits or anything else, which was a no-no. Uh, you know, I was a corporal then, and uh, we had to very politely keep them in line, you know, because they were a happy bunch of young pilots, I tell you. That's the kind of spirit that they wanted for fighter pilots. They had to be gung-ho about everything. And they were. Well, the skeet shooting very interesting. If you anybody ever tries to shoot clay pigeons, if you shoot at the pigeon, you're ever going to hit anything. You have to lead it. You have to say, "Where's that clay pigeon going to be?" And the same within the war, these pilots had to learn to lead the lead right. with their. Uh, we had uh, eight Browning automatic guns, uh, fifty uh, uh, caliber, eight. 50 caliber guns and uh, they shot close to 500 bullets each um, and uh, when you pulled the gun down you lost all your bullets in 23 seconds so yeah. all the bullets were gone so if those pilots hadn't didn't have a good aim it was a problem right and then that they had an aiming little circle uh, in front of their in front of their uh, in their cockpit there that helped them aim a little bit but they had to learn a feel for it and most of them hadn't had any skeet shooting before they got no, there. No, no, they, they hadn't. And, you know, we could tell them how to lead, but you just had to learn it. Did they get, you saw proficiency improve after, at first they hit five out of 25, and then by the end they were leaving, they were hitting 25, 23 out of 25, were they not? Well, they, they were they were improving a lot. Yes. Put it that way. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and also, uh, we had uh, shells that would just shoot a ball of fire. Oh, and you'd watch the shell, you'd trace. They would know which trace way they went. They uh -huh. were tracer shotgun shells, the first ones they ever saw. Huh. Now, what did they what did they shoot at with those those guns? What was their target? Well, they'd shoot at clay pigeons. At clay pigeons, so they knew how much they missed by. Right. Huh. You could follow that that shot because it was just a big ball of fire, the right. tracer. But we didn't shoot every everyone wasn't a tracer. Don't get me wrong there. Uh, they would just run in a tracer every once in a while. But that gave them an idea: were they too far ahead, too far behind, above or below what they were shooting at? Gave them Certainly. some pot in, in reinforcement. Certainly. Huh. Now, what else did you do there on base? Well, we were just just kind of a... Uh, we could be used for anything that they wanted us to, but pri primarily our job was on skeet range. But, uh, well, I'll give you an example, one that almost got me killed. Uh, they, they would do skip bomb practice. Uh, a P-47 carried a 100-pound skip bomb. And uh, What is a skip bomb? Tell us what a skip bomb is. Well, a skip bomb hung right under the aircraft, one to each aircraft. And about 200 to 300 yards before they got to the target, they let the bomb loose, and they come in real shallow. Like a hundred feet above land, or yeah, or lower, lower, really yeah. close. You could see them. Yeah, like really, about top really of. close. Yes, and they would let that bomb loose, and it would hit the ground and skip, and skip right into the target if they had it. Were doing it right. So if they were too short, it actually was all right. 
uh, they didn't have to be exact on the target because it bounced and it wouldn't explode till it hit its target. Right. Uh -huh. And we use practice bombs there on the, on our skip, uh, skip bomb range. Uh, they weren't fully loaded like you'd use in combat. Thank God. Yes. Because uh, can I go ahead and tell you? Sure. Truth? Yeah. Uh, Sergeant Grable and I and two more guys were sent out to work on the skip bomb target. Now the skip bomb target was just a big wall made out of wood, about 50 feet long, maybe 12, 15 feet high. Just a big wall of wood. And those P-47s would come in and aim for that with a skip bomb and, you know, practice. Anyway, we were sent on detail one day because they'd been hitting it pretty hard and blown the boards off a lot of it. So we were sitting astraddle of the doggone thing, nailing boards on, and looked over in the distance and there's about four P-47s back there in the distance was peeling off. And I said, Grateful, I believe those, those planes are gonna make a run. And he said, I hope not. <laughs> well, about the time we got through talking, they were on us. You know, they, God, they come in, they, they're doing at least 250 miles an hour. And uh, so we bailed. They, they, they missed with that first pass. So we bailed off that thing. We didn't use the ladder. We just jumped off. And, and there was holes all over the field where they, those, those practice bombs made holes. They were that strong. And boy, we dived in those things, beard our nose up in the dirt. <coughs> and that's sort I, I never will forget this, but that sergeant got on the intercom. And I don't know who he was talking to. I was afraid to ask, but he, he just, he laid them low. Said, the hell he's trying to do, kill us? And just cussed him and all. I thought, I said, Grave, you better shut up. You'll get us all court martial. He didn't care, he was mad. But that was one funny incident, but it would have been ironic if I got killed by our own airplane. <laughs> A lot of things happened in the war where we, by mistake, uh, killed some of our own people. Uh, you know, it, it was hard not to do that sometimes, but that yeah. was really in the practice field. But in the real war, out there in the, it's hard not to hit your own troops. It's very difficult yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Now those uh those props on a on a P forty seven a P forty seven empty uh, without any of those those uh, bombs on it or any of the bullets uh, weighs close to nine ten thousand pounds. Most uh, fighter planes in World War Two are about five to six thousand pounds empty. So this was a very heavy plane, a yeah, giant yeah. plane. It was a fighter and a fighter and a bomber That's that right. could do everything, and it was very strong. Are you, your hearing is probably a little bit impaired from some of the noise you were exposed to during that time, or did they have ear earphones on you or earplugs? No. You never had earplugs. No. They didn't care about that. They didn't have earplugs. Uh, they woke me up every morning if I was sleeping a little late. I was firing up those big radial engines. <laughs> Gigantic engines. It, you heard the engines when you came back on furlough to Evans, though, you would uh, hear the engines here, too, I guess, flying in a circle or test piloting it or not yeah. as much. You, yeah, I could still see them flying around. Uh -huh. yeah. They were a fine aircraft. Uh, I, I knew a fellow, well, actually, my daughter-in-law's sister was married to a guy, and her father-in-law was a fighter pilot ace wow. and he flew several different kinds of uh, plane he had seven confirmed kills and two probables that weren't confirmed out of a p-47 yeah. yeah and uh he uh said the p-47 was a beast of an airplane he said they called it the jug. It was just a. It was tw yeah. they were all the fighter pilots that were in the Mustangs and the what you call the Messerschmitts in Germany, and then uh, England had a Spitfire, 
and the Zeros in Japan, yeah. all those in the same class. But this was actually a class of its own. It was a fighter bomber. Fighter bomber. And it had a, a distance that go about a thousand miles where the reason the Mustang it started getting more uh, use in World War II because it could go 1,800 miles and could accompany those great big bombers as a bomber escort. But uh, we had uh, close to 800 P-47s over in the hump in India too. And uh, the uh, distance in India was about 500 miles from uh, India over to China called the hump. And so they were a big uh, effect over in the China hump and they're big over in uh, in the west out in uh, the invasion of Philippines and Japan but uh, or Okinawa but when you saw those props a prop is six feet long it's longer than once well, the whole prop is 12 feet wide oh yeah those props they were they they were three you know there three of them yes yeah and uh, they were just powerful I mean yeah. you uh, I don't know if you know it or not but they could only escort bombers so far yes. because of fuel. Right now. So they got a, a bright idea and they started making paper tanks, actually made out of paper and cardboard. And uh, I don't know, they'd hold a, hold a lot. And they'd use them, then drop them, you know. Uh -huh. Well, that, that, that made them able to escort the bombers clear in Germany, really. Yes, yes. But they were they were paper. I don't know how the paper was treated, uh -huh. but it 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 worked. Uh -huh. Now, did you see any crashes when you were at yes, where you at in New Jersey at Millville? M I L L V I L L E, I believe. That's right. And there is one P forty seven, I believe, right there. A, a person that collects P forty seven planes. It's a guy named Jack Murph, uh, Duffy, and he has a P-47. Right now, uh, there were, uh, in Evansville, Indiana, we made about 6,200 P-47s, and Farmingdale, New York, made about 8,000. And there's about six left flying in the world uh, at this time. Uh, and uh, there's one in New Jersey that we're trying to get back to Evansville. Evansville made uh, many of these P-47s, but... Uh, they were considered one of the safest planes and the strongest planes because they could take about one of them came back with 200 bullets in it because what David said is a radio engine a radio engine it was air cooled as opposed to water cooled all those other fighter planes I said were water cooled a water cooled plane one bullet in it will paralyze a plane but he said this was a beast of a machine it was because they could take the hits but tell us about that plane you uh, said crash there. Did you see that or you just were around when it happened? Well, I, I went out to the crash site with the rest of the guys. And uh, it had hit a lightly wooded area. And for 200 yards, it, it looked like a big scythe that come down and, and just cut the trees. Huh. And we got to the crash site and a pilot was sitting on the wing I don't know if he's smoking a cigarette or not. I doubt it because there's too much gasoline around. But he was sitting on the wing relaxing. It hadn't hurt him a bit. And uh, the plane, those wings were still intact after mowing down those trees, the tops of them. That, that's the actual truth. And uh, I never saw anything like it. And that's the only crash I ever saw, but there was a couple more crashes there. One of them was fatal. Yeah. But uh, that's one thing that the pilots liked. It it could come home was even part of the motor shot away, hmm. and you know uh, they were just phenomenal in what what they could do and take. Yeah. They uh, had a bullet uh, a. The, when the uh, gasoline tank, I, I think 260 or 270 gallon gasoline tank near, uh, right near the pilot, it uh, would, uh, if it got a hole in it, it would uh, stop the leakage. Also, it was a bulletproof uh, bubble around the pilot, so the pilots did survive, and it was uh, a lot more weight with some of these other things that were used. That's why the weight doubled, but uh, it was a very, uh, very good machine. Uh, and in World War II, we used it a lot for 
what he was saying, uh, skip bombs, but we also put could put a thousand pound bomb on each side and it, it tore up a lot of trains, tore up a lot of bridges in Europe. When we had a lot of them stationed down in Italy, they would go up and make raids on all the supply line to Italy from Germany. Yeah, they put rockets under the wings too. They had three rockets could be on each wing. The accuracy of the rockets wasn't as good and they ended up not using the rockets as much. Three rockets on each side, but you could put bombs on them and rockets on them. And the Browning Automatics were a big, strong gun. They said the Browning Automatic with four, in, uh, eight engines, when they had those open for 23 seconds, it could, it was like the power of a, of a, a mid-sized pickup truck going 60 miles an hour and it could turn over a, a locomotive. That's how powerful those bullets were coming at 200 or 300 miles an hour plus the speed of the bullet. Doctor, they were that long. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were huge bullets. Yeah. And each wing had close to uh, 2,000 on them on each side and the other wing had 2,000. And we made, we didn't make those bullets in Evans though, but we made uh, the no. 45 bullets here. Right. And, well, we made 30 calibers. We made 5 right. million, 500 million 30 calibers and uh, two and a half billion 45 caliber. We made a lot of the 30 calibers too, but not the one they used in the P40 and uh, the P47. No, no. That's 50 caliber. No, that that's a big 50. Yes. Now, uh, when you uh, then you were stationed in New Jersey. Uh, when you when the war was over, what were your thoughts when the war was over? And and when Germany surrendered, I think on uh, May 5th or in May, and then and Japan in in August or September. What were your thoughts about that when? about your life and about freedom and how we, you helped get us our freedom? Well, I had just wanted to come home like the rest of the people, you know. Pretty anxious about coming home too, I mean... You, it, right then, yeah, but uh, I didn't hate my job in, in, in the war at all, I just took it as a job, you know, uh -huh. and uh, I could have stayed in uh -huh. and got a better rank. Yeah. But I didn't want to at the time. I yeah. wanted to come home. Um, then what'd you do? Where'd you work during your time in Evansville? Did you work at Whirlpool or where did you work? I came back to my job as faultless caster. Uh -huh. And when I walked across the street, there was a picket line around the faultless caster. And so I, we finally settled one way or another, got it settled. The first strike they ever had, incidentally. Uh, <clears throat> and I went back to my job and I don't know, I, I guess I'd changed too. Uh, but I did get along with my foreman very well, which was really ironic because I really liked him before the war. But anyhow, we didn't exactly get along and I walked out and went down on Franklin and hired in at the uh, Franklin Street Frank, uh, plant, Whirlpool. And how many years you worked there, David? I worked there 38 and a half. Yes. And ironically, Whirlpool, after it, uh, it was first Republic Air, then it was International Harvester, right. then it's Whirlpool. So he started at really with the P-47s, he ended up at the Whirlpool plant that made refrigerators for right. around the world. You got that right. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, and how did you get back home? Did you kind of take by train and then how did you get out of the service? Did you go to Camp Atterbury or where did you go to get out of the service? No, uh, I uh, got out of service at Fort Dix in New Jersey. In New Jersey. And then you were in civilian clothes, came all the way home, or in an army uniform? Oh, no, I still in my army uniform. A railroad came home? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I even wore my army uniform down to Faultless Caster when I was going to report in for my job. When you came here on the train, there was a big uh, Funkhauser post right next to the L&N train. Did the people meet you from the Funkhauser post and try to get you to join the Funkhauser or, or not? I don't recall that. If, if they did, they might have, but I, I don't recall it. Very big post. It said uh, right near Willard Library down there. There's about a few blocks from the post all, from the L and N depot. So they had in their heyday had five thousand members there, mostly because of World War II vets would come back and they'd go get yeah. them, get them to join. Yeah. 
That was uh, that depot was a busy place yes. during yeah. the war. Yeah. All of Evansville was a busy place. Did when you grew up I and mean, you were around Evansville working at Falls Castle, do you remember anything about the LST plan or Chrysler or Republic Aviation or was it too top secret for you to see much of that? I, I just heard about about the LST. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about it. I, I knew they were building them, but I, I never even visited down there. Yeah, a lot of type secret. They didn't let people see things. No, uh, security was very tight everywhere. What do you? What's your opinion, David, about this next generation? You're now ninety, uh, and uh, you know. You've seen a lot of things. You've seen the airplane. You've seen the railroad. You've seen the automobile. You've seen advances in civilization. You've seen 9-11, where the United States was invaded, first time really since Japan invaded us. You've seen Vietnam War, the Korean War, Afghanistan War, a lot of other things. Our youngsters here are our next generation. What do you think the most, one of the most important things is for them to remember uh, and to cherish about the United States? Well, I wish that they would learn more about what Evansville did during the war. They're very important, very important. And, and I wish that they could have lived along with me and other, a lot of other people those days and could see how busy that Evansville really was. We went night and day. There was there was factories going around the clock, yeah, and uh, I just wish that they could understand the feeling that we had back during those days. Yeah, what David says is a unity. The country was all behind the effort. Probably never in the previous times and possibly in the future times will a country unite as a unified effort. All the women were in their factories, the daycares happened. Evansville was the biggest production facilities in the world at that time when you add per capita. So it was a tremendous place. But what David's saying is unity of a nation. All your mother and father were behind it. Uh, everybody in your family was trying to support the war effort. Part of it was a fear that we were going to be run over by Japan and Germany, but also we unified more than we've ever have. And is that what you're sort of saying too, David? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, a lot of people don't don't realize it, but not too far from where I was stationed in Millville, we were right on the coast, and there were German subs that were operating a few miles out there in, in the ocean. So that's one important reason why we were we were stationed there. Yeah, very scary time. Our coast. We started getting a lot of momentum in '43. The industrial infrastructure had wake, woken up from '42 to '43 in the United States, but '42 were very vulnerable. All of '42 very vulnerable, and and still '43 German subs until we broke their cold. They were about everywhere, dumping, dumping, uh, knocking all kinds of supply ships down. Right. And I believe 42 was when that the P-47 plant was built yeah. or started. Yeah, it's about uh, I think April was uh, April was the signing of the contract, and first P-47 flew uh, was made I think by September or, or something, and before the end of the year, or it started producing a lot. I love the P-47. It still thrills me when they fly one in here. It's a loud monster, isn't it? Big baby. It's big. It's a monster. Don't believe it's a one one prop plane, but it pulls a lot of weight. Twenty eight hundred horsepower. Uh, just it's a gigantic machine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this fellow, this ace that I told you, he. I had occasion to read his journal after the war, and he was telling about different planes, and he said that. The P-47, when, when you put it in a dive, unlike other planes, when you want to pull out a dive, you come off the throttle, come off the gas. The P-47, you had to goose it. 
and that's exactly what he told me, and he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, what he's saying, the, the P-47 coming out of the sky that was coming from high altitude was a, it was a, one of the best of all. And we don't know exactly how fast it went, but some people say close to 450, 500 miles an hour. Its speed was close to all the fighters, but coming up, uh, coming down off the, out of the high altitudes, that was it, it was its uh, uh, most uh, dangerous time, not for it, but for other planes up there. Very fast plane. Very rugged plane. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> they were hard to pull out. That that fellow told me. But he he said you you didn't come off the gas. You you gave it the gas, <laughs> which which is unlike it. Other yeah. fighting one. Yeah. And they had turbo turbo power there, just very loud too. But a uh, lot of weight and two wheels that descended and uh, the front two wheels and the back. Uh, retraction wheels. Well, they had awful, awfully good props on them, too. Mm -hmm. I forget who made them, but uh, they were electric props uh -huh. uh, where you could change the pitch. Yeah. What do you think the importance is of World War, uh, us making a World War II museum for war public air here? A P 47 we just dedicated is called Indiana Warbird, the P 47 Congress or the State Congress just dedicated it in November or in uh, June of this year, or, or last year, 2015, but what do you think the importance is of, of Evansville having a museum for a P-47? Oh, I wish we could get one. Yeah. I wish we could get one. I'm sure if we do find one, that the cost is going to be awfully high. Yeah, they're really high right now. There's only six or seven flying in the world. Paul Allen has one, there's two in Tennessee, there's one in New Jersey, a couple in Texas, but- If they're even for sale. Well, there's one for sale. The price tag's pretty high right now, but we're doing everything we can to get it here. You know. You know what they cost when we build them? Um, I think uh, Central High School had uh, maybe a hundred thousand. Hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Well, they're more than that now. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for all your information. Put that hat on and tell us about that picture behind you there. Uh, that's a picture of you. Just tell us that's your uniform. That was your dress uniform. Can you just tell us about your dress uniform? Well, it, that uniform there was a, was a light khaki summer uniform. Uh -huh. And uh, that's about it. Boy, you're handsome there. You're handsome now, but boy, look at that. Look at that man. Oh my gosh, look at that. Isn't that a good picture of you? I look can't at, believe it. Look at that. Boy, oh boy. Now, in 1930s, before we leave this topic, and we're going to close up here, in the 1930s, Tell us about the recession then. Your mom and dad lived up in Petersburg, but there wasn't a lot of jobs, and uh, you didn't have a lot of extras at that time. Oh, no, it was a tough time. Uh, mother and dad lived on my uncle's farm down in Sacramento, Kentucky, and you didn't, dad never made hardly any money at all there. People didn't have it to pay people. But we, we scrimped and got by, and then my uncle called my dad, and he was doing pretty well in, in this business, and he wanted dad to come and work for him, and me too later on. Uh, and that, when we moved to, to Indiana, of course, that was, that was just right before the war, and things were beginning to, to change. From, from the depression, you know, into better times. But in the 1930s, we had as much as 15% unemployment, which is very oh, terrible. Yeah. You experienced that, and from 1929 all the way till the war, high unemployment all across the United States, there wasn't any extras for anybody. No, uh, people, particularly farm people, uh, were working for a dollar a day. Yeah. And glad to get it. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, sir. Dave. One last thing here on David. Uh, we've got his. Uh, this is his uh, f flight. Uh, this is the uh, book they gave for the honor flight for his service to country. Well, this. That, uh, let me correct you there just a little bit. This isn't a book that they gave. This is a book that my niece's husband made up. I see. But he went on the honor flight. No, he didn't go on the honor flight. You didn't, but you did. Yeah. 
Now, the Honor Flight is tribute to anybody of World War II. We have about, uh, there were 16 million people that participated in World War II, and David's one of them. There's probably a million left right now in the United States if we're lucky. And right now, the last several years, we've had flights to Washington, D.C. to see the World War II monument. David flew out last uh, fall time and went on this last year on the Honor Flight. If you go back to 1938 in the Civil War, they had a, a train ride to Gettysburg and there were all kinds of Civil War veterans, 1930, they were all in their 90s and they did the same type of thing. Now we're yeah. flying, but at that time it was a train. But yeah. this is, uh, let's, uh, that's that book and then show them your honorable discharge there. Put that up there, David. This is discharge papers that everybody got. You wanted to show to your place of employment, but what it says there, honorable discharge, Army of the United States, and it gave his unit, service command unit, honorary discharge, and the date on there is 1946. Yeah. Uh, I don't, April, it looks like 3rd of April, 46. So we lost most of our guys in the military from the service anyway, not in death, but we, most of them discharged in 45 to 46 because there was no more war and no real thing to do except sit around. So they had to get them to leave. And a uh, big issue for employment in the United States at that time too. Okay, thanks again there, David. See the picture there? This is of, of David with his son, uh, Stephen, right there. That's World War II Memorial. There, all 50 states are represented there. And that was uh, this this last year. This is uh, when you look at uh, every state's represented, and there's uh, David, his niece, and I guess nephew, or niece's husband, and, and Stephen there next to you. Right. And that's the Indiana portion of the World War II exhibit. Right. What a what a what a time. That was pretty nice for you, wasn't it? Oh, that we had a wonderful time. And it was perfect weather. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, a lot of people really helped out, didn't they? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um <clears throat> this is David uh Thomas. Thank you very much, David. It's been my pleasure.